this video, I'm going to introduce the syllable. The syllable is very important for phonological rules for quite a few reasons. The first couple of reasons are more about the properties of speech itself. So for instance, syllables bear stress in a word, and in tonal languages, syllables are also the things that bear tone. In fact, even when we speak and we have different intonations for questions or declarative sentences, it is the syllable that usually contains the intonation. But we also have an intuitive understanding of syllables. So for instance, it's common in poetry, especially when we use haikus in English, which are usually terribly transferred from Japanese into English. Uh, we have these syllable rules, so five syllables in the first line, seven in the second, five in the third, and we make these beautiful poems with syllables. Now, of course, you know, Japanese is a very syllable language. Every single character they have, uh, at least in the basic um, hiragana and katakana systems, they are one syllable apiece. Uh, so that transfers nicely. In English, it's slightly more complicated. So let's talk about the structure of a syllable. And to show the structure, I have the word meat. And it's very convenient because it has exactly three sounds, one sound in each part of the syllable. Let's start at the very top. The first thing we have is the syllable. And this is the sign for a syllable, which is just a lowercase sigma in Greek. So sigma starts with S, syllable starts with S, we use lowercase. Uh, this is the symbol you'll see for syllable everywhere. And the syllable is really broken up into two parts. It's broken up into the onset and the rhyme. So essentially the onset would be everything at the beginning of the syllable and the rhyme is the middle and end of a syllable. And I kind of like to think about this in terms of syntax because syntax is my main area where it's like having a sentence and breaking it up into the noun phrase and the verb phrase. Where of course the verb phrase contains the verb which is the main predicate of the sentence. So think of the nucleus as the verb and then the noun phrase onset kind of like the subject of a syllable. Uh, kind of a weird comparison to make, but if you are a, mainly a syntax person, then uh, it's nice to see kind of some kind of structure in phonology as well. Okay, the nucleus is the meat and potatoes of a syllable, and these are typically every single time you encounter a vowel, you have a new syllable. So this nucleus is what the syllable is built around. And the coda is part of the rhyme as well, and the coda is everything after the nucleus. But this is kind of a very special position because codas are like the black sheep of the syllable family, where as uh, you usually only put things in codas when you can't shove it into the onset or nucleus of another syllable. So codas are like a last resort for syllable formation. So if we have a word like meat, we have meat, M-I-T, or M -E, or M E T. E is the vowel, so it forms the nucleus. M is for the vowel, so we stick it in the onset, and t is at the end. There's no onset to stick t into, so we shove it in the coda with the syllable containing e. So we have one syllable, meat. Now, I want to show you how to form syllables, and of course look at two syllable words so maybe we can see this process a little bit nicer. So there's three steps to building syllables. The first step is to place the nuclei above vowels. So every vowel gets a nucleus, which means every vowel is going to be part of its own syllable. The second is to adhere to what's called the maximum onset principle. And that is to fill your onsets up as much as possible with acceptable consonants or consonant clusters. And in every language, if we have a set of kind of rules about syllables called phonotactics, and in certain languages, that means you can have consonant clusters together at the beginning of a syllable. So for instance, in English, we can have a word like ski, where this sk cluster is together in the onset of a syllable. Compare that to Spanish, which does not allow this. What they do is they break this up into two syllables instead and have the word esqui, because they don't like the sk together. And for English, the maximum onset principle says, okay, if E is a nucleus here, this goes up to a syllable, then we should prioritize this SK in the onset of this syllable before considering it for codas. While in Spanish, it would say, okay, I filled up with as much as possible because 
syllable structures don't allow this s to go in the same onset as the k there. So then we shove it in the coda of some other syllable. And this is what the maximum onset principle says. So the acceptable consonant clusters depends on your language. And of course, if we have a problem that looks at different consonant clusters or different languages, I would specify whether it's acceptable or not. And I'm sure your professor would as well. Then the third step is after you do one and two, just dump everything else into codas. So like I said, codas, I mean, we love them because they take up our trash, but you know, we don't really want to be in codas. So here's a word. And the most important part when dealing with syllables is to write it in the international phonetic alphabet. We, we deal with sounds, not letters. If you're trying to do these syllable structures with the way that we spell words in orthography, you're going to have a terrible, terrible time because that's not how syllables work. So here's the word attention. Step one, build nuclei above every single vowel. So we're going to stick an N above all of the vowels here, and then we're going to project them up to the syllable. Because every nucleus has a syllable. So I should say every syllable has exactly one nucleus. Now, what do we do next? Well, we fill up as many onsets as, can, as we can. So for uh at the beginning, there's nothing to the left of it, so we're done with this syllable. Eh, well, we have a t next to it, and can we have t at the beginning of a syllable? Yes, so we shove it into our onset. Now, then we have n and sh before the next nucleus. So the question is, can we have ch at the beginning of a syllable? And yes, that's okay. But can we have nch at the beginning of a syllable in English? No, we can't. We can't have nch as a consonant cluster in the onset. Like, for instance, uh, the best way to do it is to try to pronounce a word. Like, can you say this? Is this a word? Nchi? 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 No, because we, we stick kind of this dummy syllable here, or this dummy vowel, in order to pronounce something like nchi. So no, that's not okay. So this is the most we can fill this onset with. Okay, and there's no syllable here that we can fill in an onset. So we now have some sounds remaining. And what we do is we just dump them into the coda. So now we have three syllables. A, uh, ten, chin. And really, if we just pronounce these words slowly, we can probably get to the syllable structure. So a, uh, ten, chin. It's not a, uh, t, n, chin. It's not a, uh, n, chin. It's a, uh, ten, chin. Okay, let's do another example strength strength so this has seven sounds let's build a nucleus above all of our vowels okay there's there's one okay there's just one there's just one strength it's so one syllable right strength so onset onset and i guess we can do uh rhyme just to kind of show all of this very explicitly so English is kind of special because English allows str clusters. So str is fine for a onset in a syllable. So we can put the s, the t, and the r all in one onset. And we don't have any other nuclei afterwards to fill another onset, which means we're just going to dump n, k, and th into the coda. Now. There's two things we should note. One, this kind of follows the sonority hierarchy. In fact, if we take a look at the five step sonority hierarchy, then we'd have something like one, one, three, five, two, one, one. And this is good because it builds up to the nucleus and then it goes down into the end of the coda that ends in one. But there are some hierarchies that consider S to be higher because it is a sibilant. And some analyses have led to consider the S as what we call an appendix. So S in these STR clusters might not actually be part of the onset, but rather part 
of an extra sound that links directly to the syllable itself. So kind of an additional sound that we allow in some clusters in English. And this isn't a huge detail for this course, but it is just something interesting I wanted to point out. Uh, but for the rest of it, I will just consider str to be part of an onset, a three consonant cluster onset. Okay, so I do want to do one more word before I end the video. I think just going examples for building syllables is probably the best way to do it. In the next video, we will target uh, rules with syllables. Right, here's a word mistletoe. And I chose this word specifically because this word can have a syllabic liquid. So I said before, we want to put nuclei above all of our vowels, but really it's more than that. We want to put nuclei above our syllabic sounds. So if we pronounce the word mistletoe, mistletoe, we do know it's three syllables. And of course, I could have just wrote it like mistletoe and not had the syllabic L, but just to demonstrate this, I do want to put a syllabic L in here. So now, what's the next step? The next step is the maximum onset principle. So I want to shove as much as I can into onsets and then dump everything else into codas. So we look at i, the first syllable. We say, is m acceptable in the onset? The answer is yes. You can have m at the beginning of a syllable. For mistletoe, is s acceptable as an onset? Yes. Is t acceptable as an onset? Yes. So this is the syllable structure for the word mistletoe. And if we pronounce it, notice when we pronounce it, we say mistletoe. We don't say mistletoe. So we don't have the boundary here. We say mistletoe, mistletoe, mistletoe. Now, <laughs> uh, I just want to contrast this really quick before the end of the video to the spelling. And I want to ask you, when you're taking your courses in high school and you're asked to break up the word mistletoe, where do you break it up? And I think I know where you break it up because this is how I was taught. I was taught when you have two consonants like this in mistletoe, you break it up between the consonants. Now what happens in spelling? What is this? Well, spelling states that the S sound is part of the first syllable, but experimental data and phonological theory, so experimental data to support the phonological theory, will tell you that this S should be in the onset of a syllable. So it should not be mistletoe or mistletoe, it should be mistletoe. So doing syllables with orthography is really just a bad idea in general because it gives you quite an incorrect analysis of what we actually say. So if you have any questions about syllable structure and forming syllables, please leave them in the comments below and I will do my best to answer them.